we're on record now. So if you want to change your name or go on virtual backgrounds or put a funny little meme on you instead of your face, then now's the time to do it because I will <laughs> cut it here. <clears throat> and, and, and we'll crack on. So what's what's been going on for you guys? What, what, what do you want to talk about? First to speak gets to go. Uh, going going okay for me so far. Uh, this assignment is uh, it's good. Team, uh, I mean professionally, a team is team is good. They're quite open to experiments, which is a good thing, you know, as a work wise. So that part going okay. Personal wise, um, yeah, things are things are okay. Settling down and uh, slowly slowly going back to normality. Yeah, nothing much to be honest. Like just came with open mind. Yeah, yeah. To, to discuss wanted anything to what, and then, yeah. Wanted to see what questions other people had. Yeah, or well, something can come out of my mind as well. <laughs> when yeah. I can hear, yeah. Is that Wait a, for a prompt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How about you, Jeff? Anything on your mind? Oh, I'm sure there's there's plenty. Uh, I, I'm in a large organization, large enterprise uh, with you know, multiple subsidiary companies that have been acquired over the years. So uh, lots of uh, change, you know, rapid, rapid change and uh, a lot of turnover with this great resignation sort of, as I've heard it referred to and other things that are going on, um, people finding jobs. So, so it's really interesting. I'm seeing um, so much change that people are just, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like they're, they're shocked, they're stunned, they're sort of stuck. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if people are afraid to even invest themselves and in the energies to like figure out what's next and to try to make something better for themselves and their teams or wherever they sit within an organization. Um, so I'm really, I guess I'm intrigued. My question would be something of, um, what, what are some fresh ideas for us to, to engage with people to kind of figure out, you know, to get them to, to open up, you know what I mean? Um, people are just, in my experience so far, they're just kind of going through this daily hamster wheel. Uh, some people are, are just easily pressured by just some sense of a business person, a boss or whatever, kind of saying, we got to get this thing done because we've got this deadline. Um, but I'm just really concerned about people like kind of going through the motions and I'm looking for ways to, they're, they're not inviting coaches in. They're not asking for somebody to come and sit with them and talk and, and open up. They're not giving them the, themselves that opportunity. So I'm without forcing myself upon people as a coach, I'm wondering what else can I do to, to help people realize, Hey, I'm here. I could, yeah. maybe I could help. Yeah. So I don't know if that forms a good question for you, Jeff, but that's kind of where I'm thinking right now. Well, it's, it certainly dinged a couple of things for me because you're not the only person that I've been speaking to that said something similar. And it, this isn't a criticism of what you've said, but it, it was quite ambiguous in a way. It's quite vague in a way, but it was touching on a topic that it sort of overlaps other things that people have been saying. Again, in a vague way, hard to put a finger on it type thing. Mm, mm. Um, and I think what I've taken from all those conversations, and I might be making a, a false, uh, joining the dots in a bad way, but I think we are in a really, really, un, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say unprecedented, but it's a, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a situation that we haven't really had to face in this particular instance. And what, I'm, and what I mean by that is not just the pandemic thing, but the, almost the fallout of it. Hmm. And there's, you've, you mentioned churn. You're not by far the only company that, that people have said there's so much churn going on. There's more demand than there is supply. So people are being tempted. And this is something that we, I used to hear a lot about um, the sort of contracting um, companies in places like India, Sri Lanka and, and Bulgaria and places like this churn because all the companies were in the same place and they could just tempt someone across the road with a small increase in salary. Um, and so I think we're seeing that here 
for the first time. Um, and there's that, plus other companies are not quite stable enough to be able to say, we're not gonna lay anybody off. Hmm. So there's this uncertainty about, well, actually, am I going to put myself out there because I might be going somewhere else soon, or actually half my team might be going somewhere else soon, or hmm. the company might be going somewhere else soon. So this lack of stability, I think has led people into almost um, self-defense, self-preservation type mindset of, well, yes. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna risk that energy. Um, and so the second part of the thing there was, is there any new ways that we can you know, engage with people? And whenever I think about engaging people, I think about, well, you know, this is gonna sound cruder than I mean it, but what do they want? What are they looking for? What are they lacking? What are they missing? Mm. Um, and security is one of the things that I think most people um, that I meet would agree is, is kind of fundamental across all human beings. We all like security. We like to feel secure. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we also like a little bit of adventure. We don't like monotony. So is that sort of tension there? We like growth, but we also like comfort. Again, another, another bit of tension there. And when we're lacking one thing that we think is fundamental to us and to our happiness, then we generally kind of make sacrifices and we'll compensate with other things or our mm -hmm. behavior will, it's kind of like a kid acting out if you like, because they haven't got, they don't feel they've got enough attention or what have you. So where am I going with that? I think having that, you know, having that conversation about what's missing in your environment at the moment and the, the way that I tend to, I tend to have that kind of conversation is, you know, when was the last time you felt really alive at work, when you felt really good, when things were working for you, where you had what you needed mm. to be successful, mm. you know, where all the cards were in your favour, um, and you went home at the end of the day or the end of the week and thought, yes, that was a good day, or that was a good week. And compare that to now, what, what could we do that would get you closer to that state? And they, to be honest, they very rarely have an instant answer because it is sure. quite abstract. But just letting that seed for a minute or even a day or even a week. Um, so I just fin finished filming. Um, filming sounds like a grand term, but we, we <laughs> did our episode one of our prestigious pints episode for the for the podcast last night with um, Sally Ann Freudenberg. I don't know whether any of you know Sal, um, but she's she a PhD in collaboration, um, huge proponent of neurodiversity and inclusive collaboration and things. Mm. Um, and one of the things that we were talking about was slow retrospectives. That wasn't the term we used. I don't think she actually coined a phrase for it, but she said one of the, one of the things that, she's kind of got slapped herself in the face for after quite a few years of agile coaching was sort of going along with the trend of um, playing up to the extrovert. So we went from all developers sitting in their cubicles to all developers in open space with post-it notes on rooms and icebreakers and funny games. And she said, neither of those extremes was you know, all encompassing was inclusive. And so retrospectives will often get people in, in a room for an hour and say, right, what do you think? What do we do? How do we make it better? And some people really, really love that urgency. They love that sense of focus. They love that sense of, you know, we're here, we can get something done in an hour, brilliant. Other people really need time to process. Mm. And so they did this experiment, her and Catherine Kurt did this experiment around slow retrospectives. So they put the uh, stuff on the wall, how do we want to improve, whatever, whatever they were doing, mad, sad, glad or whatever. And during the course of a couple of weeks, people could add stuff to that wall as and when anonymously. Um, and she said, you know, the depth of learning, the depth of reflection they got was magnitudes greater than everybody in a room for an hour. Hmm. I, I, I went off on a bit of a tangent there. But... I, I heard that as, thank you very much. I heard that as another creative potentially creative way to create some engagement is um, setting up some sort of this slow retrospective way that people could pass by or, or go and look at the virtual board or something, process a bit, maybe let it ruminate. And when they pass back by on another day, they could finally contribute if they 
thought of something. So yeah. that's how I received that. But that was helpful. Thank you for that, Jeff. No worries. Welcome, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Again. Good. Good. Thanks. It's um, five in the morning here, though, so I'm I just going to say my first coffee. <laughs> I'm trying to work out the time zone. That's yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. Have you been to the gym yet, or are you going to go after this? No, I'll go after this. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, still, still on my first coffee though, so I'll just need a wee bit of warm up. Yeah, yeah, no worries. You ease yourself in. Yes. Um, so yeah, quite a few people said they were going to join, but then never get everybody here on time. So um, it is being recorded. Uh, so whether you want to, whether that affects your behaviour or, or appearance, whatever, that's up to you. But it won't be shared publicly just with your own community. So. Um, yeah, anybody else got any, any thoughts on that in terms of, you know, this, this sort of different ways of engaging people in, in, in this new situation that they're finding themselves in, especially when it comes to, if you're noticing the same thing around high levels of churn and, and change. Yeah, I think um, there are some, yeah, there's definitely some new, unique challenges at the moment. Um, around um you know the the current situation um i guess the questions i have are more we have we we've got some organizational change at the moment where we're bringing in change management and they do a lot of that they do a lot of upfront work around um preparing people but that tends to there tends to be a lot of overlap where they come in to start of the, some of the vision creation a lot of it is more aspirational but it also creates a little bit of fatigue with the stakeholder groups that we're working with as well, because they um, they have all of these sessions that they need to go to for the change management people. And then the product owner comes in and they're, they're kind of a bit, a bit over it by the time we come in there. So, um, so yeah, have you ever had to work in with something like that where you're working in with sort of change management or something similar that, or have you ever seen that situation and, and, is there a is there a way to sort of deal with that elegantly? So I heard fatigue and change management, and in my head I put those together as change fatigue. Is that is that what you're talking about? No, no, no. It's more it's fatigue on that actual engagement part. So having all of those okay. workshops. So um, it's not so much the change fatigue. That's why we brought in the change management to deal with the change fatigue. And now I guess there's maybe some workshop fatigue. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they they sort of come in two or three months before and start doing that that ad car sort of stuff where they they get people ready and um uh you know because i guess there is a lot of change we're changing all of our erp crm everything so um so it's about getting people on board who might have been there for 15 years using the same system and maybe 20 years that's that's how old the incumbent system is and why does it need to change and so um so they're definitely needed but um, yeah. I guess, yeah, that, there's just where that overlap is, there seems to be a significant overlap and we're working in with them, but, um, but obviously they have their, their methodologies and the things that they're trying to achieve. Um, and they tend to try and do a heck of a lot more upfront and it starts to, it becomes more difficult to manage some of the expectations rather than making them easier to manage, which was what was okay. hoped. Hmm. And who, if you had to sort of pick out one, role or group or department that was more fatigued than others which would you say um so a lot of this is going into the crm work so <clears throat> to start with um i mean it's probably something uh that uh, not a lot of people would relate to because it's in local government but um probably in community development which works with sort of the other organizations um charity organizations gives out funding around grants and things mm. like that for community development um and they work with sort of homeless organizations and and all of those types so i guess um i guess perhaps them um there's a little bit of fatigue there and getting time from people because they come in and they say okay we want all these half day sessions or we want all of these you know we're going to need three or four hours a week from this big group of staff. And then I come in and go, okay, I've got two half day sessions and then I'm going to need a couple of, at least a couple of hours a week. 
Um, plus, we're going to need you all the way through develop, all the way through delivery, and we want to be, we want full access to you, and we want, you know, um, want you to come along to all of our reviews, and we want you to come to a bunch of stand-ups, and <laughs> want you to do all this other stuff, and they're kind of going, oh, when can I get back to my job? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know whether that that question I asked was relevant or not. It just, it just seemed something I wanted to ask. But from my, from my experience, when it comes to change. There's, I've seen a number of different reasons why people tend to get a bit fed up with it. Um, I haven't got any, you know, sexy names or model for this. I'm just off the top of my head. The first one is, what's in it for me? You know, do they actually mm. get that this is something that's for their benefit rather than do they feel it's something that they need to do because others want them to do it? You know, a sense of obligation. And immediately, if it's if it feels like a chore or something they don't see the point in everything's going to feel like pulling teeth. Um, the other thing I think is a little bit maybe around, maybe not so much around the word change as such, but something that I know I had a big issue with in a lot of the organisations I've worked in where they called it transformations. Because in our heads, we, we are kind of, um, uh, Sal put in my head yesterday this phrase dead, deadline junkie I've never yet never heard it before I think we kind of are we like to finish things and so if we've got in our heads we need to go through this change then the, one of the first things we tend to do is we tend to imagine a finish line mm -hmm. and we're always measuring ourselves not so much in how far we've come but how far we've got left to go and in something like a transformation, which can be seen as really, really big, really long, and we might even admit that it's going to be quite long, that, that sense of motivation can really, really dip. Just look at anybody's New Year's resolutions or trying to start a new habit. We will hit, I think, oh, really, why did I even start this kind of, before it becomes normal and accepted in part of what we do. So there's the always looking at the finish line when actually what we're doing, if we actually look at a longer period of time, there's a good chance that we're always going through some kind of change in our companies. So it's yep. not that we're starting a change project, it's just a, a, a different pivot, you know, a different way of inspecting and adapting what we're doing. And if we can change that mindset of, you know, a distinct thing where there is a finish line, that might help. Um, and the other thing I've seen right. quite important is around this sense of achievement which ties in i suppose to achievability um oh, i'm gonna wrap my brains now there was a guy called i'm gonna say daniel goizetta something like that who was some kind of executive at coke or pepsi mm -hmm. and he was tasked with increasing the the, the, the amount of um pepsi or coke drinks that the general population were drinking and um, it was something that they they drink on average people drink something like you know, 32 ounces a day or something like that and four ounces of that is pepsi and they wanted to increase that they wanted to close that 28 ounce gap or something but instead of focusing on the 28 ounces we just need to get to, from four to six or something like that you know and it's it's that kind of achievability positioning something in a way that yeah we can we can actually do this that's actually doable and it, the finish line is perhaps closer than we thought it was. It hasn't moved, but we've just reframed it in a way that's, that's more achievable. And then getting that sense of we've actually achieved something. I can see that the effort we put into this workshop has actually worked out, not just for everybody, but for me. The return on my investment, I can see it. That, I think, is another big part. And I think you also mentioned something really, really important there which doesn't get spoken about enough, which is that a lot of this stuff, these workshops is on top of your day job. Yeah. So the expectation is, yeah, you still got your 48 hours a week, or whatever you contract to do. And by the way, we need you to put a bit extra shift in because we're going through this change program. Yeah. And it's just not, it's not fair. It's not sustainable. Um, and I think that happens quite a lot and is, yeah, you're almost on to a loser straight away. Whereas if you, even if you just said, you know what, 10% of your workload, tell, show me 10% of your workload, I will cut that out for you. 
Right. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of the, as the individuals, <clears throat> perhaps doing it to themselves a wee bit as well, because they kind of, I think uh, they have been given permission to reduce their workload, but I think they, um, they're they unlikely to to actually take that permission. So yeah, maybe it's a bit of a, maybe start that off with a little bit of that um, as well, just making sure that they, they actually think about it themselves and make that choice consciously to, to reduce their own workload. Mm. Could, could be worth a shot. Yeah, being the first person to take management up on that offer is quite a scary place to be, isn't it? The value. Yeah. Okay. I'm just not going to do that bit. <laughs> yeah. You've got to be quite brave or secure to do that. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. No, no worries. Anybody else experience this workshop fatigue? Yeah, that was about to say. I can't resonate what you just said, Jeff. And um and the leadership still want those teams to deliver something, right? And still take part in those workshops or the transformations they're doing. And I can fully resonate with that. <laughs> and it's happening. <laughs> so, yeah. So I I kind of asked the question. Obviously, I'm not um, into that business unit at the moment, but I did ask the same question. They said, yeah, that's what it is, you know? So how would we, so that prompts to my question. So how would we change the leadership mindset into that? So they think about clearing the way for the teams to, if they want to do transformation, think about the team and, and eventually join them in that journey as well. Not like just saying, yeah, we don't need the workshops. Only team needs those workshops. Um, how would you go about changing leadership's view on that? I think it depends on, on the, your relationship you have with them. So when I'm working with leaders, it's usually in, in, the, in the role of coach. Mm -hmm. um, so I have permission to, to play what I'm seeing, but also ask them to challenge their own assumptions about how other people might be perceiving the same situation. So they might, for example, be perceiving this as well, this is in their interest. Why wouldn't they do? I don't, I don't understand why they're not jumping at this. You know, this, this is good for them. Having a better system to work with, it makes it easier to, you know, to do their job. It's going to save time. Um, whereas the people doing the job might be thinking, oh, they're just doing this so they can cut costs and make some of us redundant. Or um, they don't have to go through the, the switching or the actual having two systems in parallel at the same time. So think, helping people see a different perspective. So I often place them in like perceptual positions where literally get people to stand in different parts of the room and say, right, in this position, you're thinking about it from your perspective. In this position, you're thinking about it from this person's perspective. And you be them. This per this position, you're thinking about it from this person's perspective. Be them. And you don't then have to have that debate, that discussion where someone has to admit that they're wrong. They're coming up with these ideas and these different perspectives themselves, increasing their emo emotional intelligence, emotional awareness, you know, empathy. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're working, um, if your relationship is slightly different, you know, say you're an agile coach in the organisation, what what's your kind of relationship there? What, what what would your natural? This is more of a rhetorical question. What would your natural um, in to a conversation be? Are they asking you how are things going with the teams? Are they asking you so why isn't this going as quickly as possible? But whatever your in is, then using that to say. So, look at well, what's in it for them you know why do they want to, why should they want to hear this truth what's going on for them that might stop them hearing this truth even though you're saying it quite out loud yeah because just because i say something doesn't mean you hear it um and you know, what's what might be incentivizing them or, or compromising their incentives to act in a way that they would rationally like to mm -hmm. um, but yeah there are lots of different ways that you could be engaging with each of these people right Okay, thank you. Andreas. Hi there. Sorry for being late. No, no worries. No worries. It's uh it's like an open door thing. You turn up when you're here. The door the door will be shut at six, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On a bit of a different note, um Yeah. If you the something I'm just recently found out last night. I think I told you before the scrum, our scrum master was sick for a couple of weeks mm. recently. Um, the team's really mature. They pretty much just self-organize and manage themselves. Um, so the scrum master's kind of been moved to a, a newer team. 
uh, because they, they really do need her a lot, a lot more. It will be the, we, you know, there will be another Scrum Master coming on, probably won't get one until the, probably the start of next year really at this stage for how long it'll take to hire. Um, but it'll be the third Scrum Master change this year. But as I say, the, the team is very strong, very mature. Would you suggest, or, or what are the, what should we be thinking about when we decide uh, whether to to have one of the team members be an interim scrum master, um, bring in a contractor through that period and have more change um, and potentially we don't know the contractor it might be someone who's might not be might not be a good fit or just let the team run without yeah. a scrum master. Okay, cool. I'm just making a couple of notes because oh, I start answering a question. I forget the different points. Um, so a couple of things came into my head there. First of all, if the team's that mature, that's generally a question that you can ask the team to say, you know, of all these options, what do you think would work best for you between now and then? Um, and you know, they're probably in a state now where they've seen things change. They know the impact of change, but also you know, they, 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 can, they, can, they can work that through. Um, a slightly less mature team might not push themselves as much. But having said that, um, one thing that I've seen, which kind of goes against the general advice that I would tend to give, so general advice I would tend to give is, is around stability. Um, but one of the, the exceptions to that that I've seen in practice is with mature teams, where they will consciously choose to have more frequent changes of Scrum Master because they will deliberately bring in a different fresh perspective on a more frequent basis and allow them to greater chance of seeing more and more development opportunities because they're different people, they're seeing different things, they're fresh sets of eyes. And they're mature enough and confident enough to be able to say, yeah, we're okay with that. Yeah, that, that we're, I see what you're saying there. But we're okay. We like that about us. We're going to we're going to keep that. Thanks. Mm. Yeah, good point over here. Um, the other thing around mature teams that they can offer an organisation is almost like apprenticeship schemes. So I, I, I like I, I kind of agree with what you're saying and your reservations around the contractor side of things. If you were going to go for an interim, um, and and you know, the team thought, yeah, I'd, we could do it, but we'd rather not. It's often a great opportunity for a, for a new person, a youngish, not necessarily uh, chronologically young, but experienced young, mm -hmm. to you know get a bit of experience in the role. Um, and you know this team's probably good enough that they can challenge them a little bit, but not let them fail too much. Um, and they get a nice little bit of exposure, knowing that there's a bit of a safety net because in a few months' time, someone new is joining. Yeah, funnily enough, that was kind of our recent scrum master who's moving on was a brand new scrum master. And okay. that was after coming from one who was 15 years experience in agile coaching and scrum master who would help make the team very, very mature. And then we've, we've kind of done that. And now they're moving on to help a, a brand new team who are yeah. um, probably quite resistant. So they've got some real challenges, but they've, they've made some really good inroads in there of just some of their early forming sessions. And made some made, you know so they've really picked it up and they're doing really really well so it's, it's really really great to see so they have yeah. kind of already nurtured this new scrum master so yeah yeah it, what do you and think did, about and how did they feel about it did they enjoy that process or yeah. did they think that yeah. that's like an extra thing that they'd rather not you know split their focus on no they're they're a very um the culture and the team is very sharing and um it's 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 a, a very, very mature team but also a very nice team to work with they really care about each other and they care they when they bring someone into the team as well whether it's a scrum master or um you know a new tester or a vendor who's coming in to join us for six to 12 months or because we do have that happening as well um they really welcome them in and, and give them a lot of support um so they use a lot of uh a lot of sort of peer programming practices whether it's programming or not um you know they pair up a fair bit yeah. so um so yeah no they have enjoyed that uh they have been fine with that I, I wonder as well is there is it worth giving one of the team members an opportunity to or you know, ask you yeah i suppose we will ask the team but what do you think about what kind of overhead do you think that would give them if they're already in the team kind of following this pretty similar practices and they're probably not going to try and bring in anything too revolutionary um 
is it yeah. is it worth giving like is that going to take a lot of time away from their production do you think for a team like that i'll come back to that one after i've heard what Rowett's got to say okay Rowett's raised his hand on this so he wants to say something. Oh. yeah actually my question was on the uh, do actually mature teams do it need a full-time scrum master because they're quite mature they know what practice they're doing they know how to facilitate they know how to be technically uh, experts you know have a technical stability as well and uh, or do they need more of a like a, just a um, you know a coach or ad hoc coach whenever they need someone they can go to rather than have a full-time scrum master if they're quite mature enough so I think that the, the, my general answer to that one is you can get to a point where you don't need a full-time scrum master. That should be there. In fact, that, yeah, they should be aiming to not need a scrum master at all would be mm. what I would typically say. But yeah. um, I know of a few teams and it, it sounds a little bit like your team might be fitting this into this uh, sort of bracket, Matt, in, in that they, this idea, that when you think about um, growth, you know, a growing B within an organization. Most people think about a scrum master growing a team. But there are a few situations where that team actually can help grow scrum masters and even product owners because they're experienced, they're stable enough. I've yet to, I, I did meet one team that said, um, you know, we don't, we don't need retrospectives because, you know, we're awesome. Um, so what should we do now? And my advice to them was to resign set up a new company and charge shitloads of money as the best team in the world for hire because um, if they are the one and only perfect team then they could be rolling in money but it's a slightly facetious comment but, but in my experience you know every team has the opportunity to improve some way and i know it's a little bit of a cliche but even if you are at the top of your game you're only at the top of this game and the game is almost constantly changing and you, if you, so the, the apex predator theory that they've said is usually around organizations. So the, the, the organization with the largest market share has optimized themselves for the current market conditions, which makes them prime candidates for extinction when the market conditions change. Same for a team, optimize their processes for how things work now. And slowly and surely they become more and more I-shaped after they've become T-shaped. And, and so what the really smart teams will do is they will actually force themselves, almost like a chaos monkey style, you know, resilience building. We're gonna break something and then work out how we as a team can, can actually respond to that really, really well. Whether it's we're gonna take someone out of the team for a sprint or, you know, we're gonna swap a new member in or we're going to, and it sounds counterintuitive because you're, you're taking something that's working really, really well and making it work less well. But that resilience, that ability to respond to the unknown is a huge um, competitive advantage in your teams if you can get to that point. Now, could a team member play that role? Yeah, they could. How much overhead would it take? Kind of depends, you know, what their comfort levels are. If, they come, if they're happy to just sort of sit there where they are right now and say, Do you know what, we're pretty good. We've got things ticking over quite nicely in there. We're very predictable. We don't really need to push things that much anymore. Everything's working quite nicely. Let's not rock the boat. Things are probably, the, the ceremonies are probably running really smoothly. The product battle is probably in a pretty good state. It's, it, it's all, almost, you don't really need planning sessions. This team might almost be close to a pretty good Kanban setup because everything screams nicely. Um, but if they wanted to push themselves, if they wanted to you know, increase their resilience, then I would suggest that the team of playing that role wouldn't be the place to go for it. Andrea wants to jump in as well. Yeah, there's another option and opportunity to be considered from my point of view. How about splitting the team and spreading the knowledge, the XP and whatever they have in hands to other teams who might not be in such a comfortable situation? depending on circumstances that could be the right point to say, okay, guys, you have figured it out for yourself. Now spread the news, show the practices, show the other guys what we can do here. Yeah. Depending on the circumstances, that would be an option to grow the company, not the team. Yeah, it's definitely an option. Um, I'm going to link back to, to um, actually the first 
conversation that we had with Jeff, which is around motivation and engagement and uh, when things are churning. And a lot of people in those teams that I've experienced, they've got to that point that they things are working so well. They trust their teammates. They've got this sense of completion. They've got this sense of camaraderie, that identity as a team. And the idea of breaking that team up is such a, a sort of visceral threat to them. They really, they, they, they don't want to lose that attachment, even though they can see the logic in spreading this out and, you know, the idea of, but the idea of going to a new, and they almost think, well, if I'm going to leave this team, I might as well leave the company. Um, now, I'm not, that, that shouldn't be an issue. In, in an ideal world, that shouldn't be an issue. Right, because we're all corporate citizens, and you know we all know that actually helping the organisation be better is better for us individually. But we're also a little bit selfish as individuals, um, and our working week. You know, these people have probably all been on dysfunctional teams as well, and when they've found one team that's working really, really well, they probably don't want to take that gamble. And that I found quite difficult, and the. That has actually been one of the biggest areas of, I would say, subconscious resistance to change. Um, that might not be that might not be too true because you don't see it as often as you see dysfunction. But people don't realise that they're trying to protect what they've got when they're resisting what's on offer. In my experience, but the principle behind that is absolutely spot on. So uh, years ago, when we when um, when the first conversations around scaling Scrum came out, the idea around a tiger team, to tiger team or not, you know, was was the debate that most organisations had. Do you get one team working really really well, and then split them, so that you can seed two teams or three teams, or do you say right you you've got it going, you stay together, everybody else look at them, and there's no right or wrong answer. And there's all sorts of variables to take into account, not least of which the, the personal, the emotional things. Um, so I don't think there's there's a blueprint out there, but the, this maybe there's maybe there's a middle ground. You know, maybe our sprint, our experiment sprint, our stretch sprint, whatever you want to call it, our, our chaos monkey sprint is we're going to take one person out of this team or two people out of this team to go and work with other team members, and we're going to see if we can get back to being amazing by incorporating these new people, while those people can go off and spread some knowledge and spread some love elsewhere in the organization. Maybe that's a middle ground, I don't know. Yeah, I certainly felt that visceral reaction that you talked about when I've got all this backlog to get through and there's new um, new initiatives coming up and I thought, I need this team, <laughs> I need the team to not change. Yeah, even that just as a product owner, let alone you know, one of the actual people in the, directly in the team um yeah on a on a slightly related note when uh, we talk about when i'm talking to leadership teams about uh capacity management um, and you know how do you resource things within your teams in an agile way um you know, the, the one piece of advice that really sort of hits them in the face is don't let your best person do the work. Um, so if you've got an expert in whatever it is, that's the one person in your organization that should not be doing those tasks. They, but they're the best person at it. They'll do it quickest, they'll do it best, yeah, but they'll be the only person that can do it. Um, whereas if you've got them slowing down by mentoring somebody else, you, you will know this, right? But this, this, you, you can increase your resilience as an organization. But that individual, are they motivated by the prospect of mentoring? Are they secure enough in the value that they add that they don't think they're undermining their value by sharing their skills with other people in the organization? And these aren't you know, above the line things. These are emotional, psychological things, but they're all part of behavioral responses. If I think, yeah, I'm not, I'm not becoming more dispensable to the organization by helping people grow their skills in what I do. And I'm not becoming less relevant by not keeping my hands in. And I can cope with seeing someone do it slightly not as well as I would do it. Then everyone's going to be in a better place. Mm. 
And the same goes for a team, right? So if you've got that team that's brilliant at this, arguably, you could argue, they're the last team that should be doing that thing because that team will become eye shape. Hmm. Possibly. Mm. Andreas wants to add yeah. on and, and to build on, on what you're saying, Jeff, um, if that team is so good, they should be hunting for the obstacles, the impediments in the organization and help the organization to grow itself. Because inevitably, you, you have two aspects in Scrum. That is doing the work that is valuable to the customers and showing the organization what obstacles they have to arrive at that point. Mm -hmm. So they then could hunt for, for the obstacles and show management where to improve the system. Yeah. If you leave yeah. the team alone and just use them as a feature factory, let's say, um, yeah, you could do that. That would be waste from my point of view. Hmm. They could become internal consultants to help the management with their knowledge from the trenches, where are our obstacles and what is the most important bottleneck to be resolved right now. Yeah. We had, um, I don't necessarily... I, I don't, I'm hesitant here because I don't want to dilute the great point that you just made there, Andreas, um, with an anecdote that might not be valuable. But we had a team back when I was at BT, some really, really good XP people that we've managed to hire, a lot of them from the States, because uh, that's where XP was quite big uh, back at the turn of the century. Um, and you know, to bring in this idea of agile engineering practices and so on and they very quickly became they were, they called them the code red team so basically they became the team that was parachuted in to sort out you know the, the failing projects the ones that were on the on the radar of um, the senior management was that a good use of them you could argue yes um, and i think in the early stages it was a good use of them because um, they and this is kind of related to you know, how companies like you know, ThoughtWorks work is that going in and just solving the technical problems gives you a short term nice feeling but then you become dependent upon that and the people that you leave behind are no better so to begin with they were given the time to actually coach and pair with the people in place and as they got a bit of a reputation the projects got more and more important, more and more crucial, more you know, shorter and shorter deadlines. Um, and, and they didn't, it was just a case of come in, fix it, stop the red light flashing, go on to your next mission. Um, so there's, it, there's I think the, the moral there is that you, these people can be add value in lots of different ways to your organization, either as a team, as a feature team, split out as mentors, all sorts of different ways that they could add value as a team. That, that really intrigues me in terms of, I guess, like an operational or mobilization sort of a perspective on that. Like, how have you seen a, an organization successfully realize, you know, where, where on the battle map of the organization they need to drop in a team like that and kind of define what, what success is going to look like so that they know when to pull them out and you know what I mean? Like just logistically, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued as to, has anybody seen this as a model kind of, I mean, what you described, Jeff seems to suggest it works somewhere. So I'm curious, like if I wanted to try to introduce a pattern like that in another organization, I guess that's the question. How, how would I maybe do that? <laughs> well, the floor, the floor in, in that setup that I described there was, it wasn't really very strategically prioritized. It was, it was literally a case of highest paid person in the room, who knows who, you know, who owed who favours that meant that this was the project of the day. Uh, Organisations that have done it better have managed to say, have managed to link strategy and tactics. They've managed to say, strategically, these are our priorities. This is what we're trying to achieve. We're going to cut down some of the stuff that doesn't contribute to that because then we have more people to work on the most important stuff. And when things aren't, you know, when, when things are threatening our strategy, 
we will take more drastic action. Um, but we know how to decide which areas deserve more attention and actually when it's better to actually not fix it now. Because sometimes coming in and putting out a fire just invites people to become arsonists. Yeah, oh, we had some, good. we had something very similar at the start of this year, and it was exactly that. It was the because we have our essentially our roadmap that we we sort of have a fairly goal oriented outcome oriented roadmap um, that is across multiple work streams, and and then there's the stuff that the exec just comes up with that they suddenly need. And we put together a team that we called Spec Ops, and they said, "Give it to Matt because." Because he, he he always manages to get stuff done, and then so I was there was another work stream and two teams I was feeding, um, and we did it, but I'm not I just said I'm not doing this anymore. This is way too hard. So um, but it was exactly that. It wasn't strategic. It was just the stuff that oh we also need this on top of all your other stuff. But it was that we also need this team. Um, there was nothing strategic or clever about it really, other than yeah. I think for me, one of the one of the metrics that it's actually a really almost um, business school 101 metric, if you like. Well, two business school 101 metrics that actually become more important when you actually start doing this stuff strategically are payback and opportunity cost. So usually we think internal rate of return, ROI, they're the, they're the clever metrics, they're the MBA metrics, they're the, they're, they're the sexy metrics. But payback, when can we actually get our return on investment back? It's effectively saying, how can we run cheap experiments? How can we get an MVP that gives us our investment back quickly? And opportunity cost is, well, if I do this one thing, what can I not do? What does that stop me doing? Or what do I have to stop doing? And I was, um, actually, I, I posted in the community today, I was reading this, this book, Near Ayal, around Indistractable. And part of, actually, no, it was a podcast around that and it was the etymology of the word decision and so decision is to cut right so when you're making a decision you're cutting off your options because you're deciding on that and a lot of executives and organizations don't see the cost of the decision they don't see what's being cut and really good agile implementations help people make better decisions because they can see quite clearly the cost, the opportunity cost, as well as the actual, you know, how much is this going to cost me in terms of manpower and capital and whatever, the opportunity cost. Um, and I think that's a really important part of it for me. I imagine what kind of management would listen to something like that, a discussion like that. What is it that we are aiming for? strengthening our structures and not doing things i have rarely seen someone to 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 take advantage of that discussion and and to focus on that so um i'll be i'll be interested so you say rarely so that means you have so i'll be interested in in your example of what you have seen um for me the general thing around this is new so i, I don't know what the what the data is these days but when when i was at bt we were always told that senior management generally change every two to three years so you've got a ceo cio they're around for two or three years and they go to the next job same with your, your your board members they change they get promoted they leave they get pissed off they didn't get promoted they leave um so two to three years and when you get someone new come in they want to make an impact they want to be able to say i changed this i made an impact i took this organization I did this program and it was better. Um, and so those people who are new generally are the ones that are more open to doing something like that in my experience. The ones that are close or they've been there a couple of years, they generally don't want to rock the boat because they've got their next gig lined up. They don't want to leave on a bad note. So they don't want to take a risk in my experience. What, what about you? Well, the organization I have in mind and I have seen is it reflects itself and the management is listening very well to the people. 
to the experiments and and the experiences they are having in in, in the daily work so they don't think they have all the answers they are not so um convinced about their point of view of the world they have learned that they have only part of the answers and the other answers are somewhere else and they have to come together across hierarchies without thinking in silos or so what is the opportunity here where are we good or missing some customers demands or requests that Where has you see those people get to that point ah so far i have in mind two consultancies of the agile ways of working and they are reflecting a lot and they are changing their managers regularly you you don't get go into that one and, and have a career in management it's it's just a role for cut time and then you you switch that is the the type of organization i have in mind here and the reflection where where have we shifted decisions that could have been made maybe where have we been too late where have we been too early these kind of questions they are rarely rarely discussed coming together regularly without a, a, a clear agenda and just reflecting what have we observed like a retro big retro maybe that is really rare to be seen I've introduced it in one company I work with and it worked well, but it took a time, like a year or so, to get there. And we had some ugly truths out there. <laughs> Emotionally heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen some really, um, well, a couple of really frustrating, just frustrating for me personally, situations where I, I was, almost 100 percent certain that every single member of the senior leadership team understood what was needed but there were some other games going on and i wasn't aware of them to begin with um, and usually it's to do with jobs changing so they knew that the ceo was going to be moving on and they were pretty sure that it was going to be a choice between two or three of the other who was going to take that person's job and so that you know, there was they weren't incentivized to collaborate or look good or, or, or take personal risks. Uh, and just that that little game was such a frustrating way to to miss out, a frustrating reason to miss out on what could have been a really, really good um, good outcome. So there are lots of reasons why it won't work, which makes you wonder, how does it ever work? But... Hmm. How did we get there? It needs a level of healthy conflict there, which is hard to sustain, even if you can have it once in a room. Yeah, healthy conflict's a, a well-used phrase, isn't it? I, for me, I think part of that is visible. Um, I think for conflict to be healthy, it has to be transparent. Like we have to know what we're having conflict about, not conflicting about one thing, as a as a way of avoiding talking about another thing you know um and that's what i that's what i've seen more often than not people holding their cards to their chest at that leadership level because they they're looking at their next move um going back to your original question you know, what kind of people would would not do that i think this is gonna this is a risky answer for me to give i'd say younger people so oh. younger leaders who know that or feel at least that they've still got time on their side you know they don't have to get this particular role um and i think what i'm seeing i am seeing again i'd love to see the statistics i say let's see the data on this the the age of board members the age of senior leadership teams is i would say has dropped quite considerably from when i started um and it's become more diverse not enough but still um, and i think that's that's a good thing there's a higher appetite for risk the younger we are um there's a higher appetite for collaboration generally speaking i think um but having said that there's more wisdom later on when you've seen these kinds of things 
but whether that wisdom turns to cynicism is the is the key thing I think for me. Oh, that was an enjoyable conversation. Sounds like a startup what you're describing. <laughs> well, and I think that's part of the reason why boards and senior leadership teams are becoming younger because organizations who are slightly more traditional realize that the only hope they've got is to bring in that, that energy, that, that sort of startup mentality and give people who would normally not want to work in a corporate environment. They are that, so have that sort of entrepreneurial mindset. Give them the resources that they need to, to channel that energy in the name of the organization rather than go out you know, and risk their own, um, risk their own and almost get a head start with a bit of bit of backing, a bit of finance, a bit of resources around, a bit of infrastructure around them. Um, so yeah, I mean it was even even in even in government departments, there are sort of spin-off startups to try and uh, inject, I said, sorry, I'm, I said, even in government departments. So I wasn't a dig at you, Matt. I was thinking more about my, my own local area. I've seen it. Um, no, I've seen it here, my council we went to visit. So yeah, no, it was, it was quite interesting. They did created this little little team that was essentially allowed, allowed to do whatever they wanted and come up with, and they came up with some really cool stuff, little apps and things like that. And yeah, it was quite interesting, but it's not there anymore, unfortunately. Well, and, and in a way, they probably shouldn't, right? If they've been successful, they should probably be either subsumed into something else or spun off. If they haven't been successful, then they would stop being funded and a new, new thing should be sped up. Um, so they, they shouldn't be around for that long. But yeah, that idea of injecting that mindset in, that injecting that energy in and creating, and I'm going to, again, perhaps because I really like this sort of closure idea, I'm going to bring this back to, to Jeff's original thing and take it back to where we started different ways of engagement, creating that sense of a bubble, you know, whether it's an island or something, something, some small area that people feel that they can have impact on, they can feel safe in, they can feel connected within, that they can feel um, does provide them some stability, but also the ability to, to, to do something new. I'm not necessarily talking about creating new corporate bubbles, but just some kind of um, island. Say, right, this is us. We are committed here. We are in this we have a purpose we have a goal we can trust each other we can put our energy in and not feel it's going to be wasted i think that is a different way of engaging people within a larger organization that might be worth exploring nicely done cool tying it tying it all together i like it yeah <laughs> well thanks for joining guys thank you thank, thank you. you thank you thanks everybody thank you jeff thank you everyone thank you thanks, thanks, thanks to meet you take thank care. you take care, all. Bye. All right. See you. Cheers.